blood on the streets of Baltimore, USA. This man was shot just 30 seconds ago. In the midst of the chaos, someone dials 911. In this city, help arrives within 90 seconds. The fire truck comes first because it has the fastest response time, and every firefighter is trained to sustain life until the medics reach the scene. Just one hit you. Huh? One shot. Look at the litter. In a backboard. The elite paramedic teams are also part of the fire department. The bullet's gone completely through the man's leg. Just hold still, okay? We got an ambulance for you. Let's get your arm out of here. What's your name? James. Just relax. In this city, six people are shot every day. Baltimore has a population of 670,000, the same as Leeds. But while Leeds has six fire stations, Baltimore has 46. The city's residents rely heavily on the 911 emergency system. Half of them call it every year. Alongside the upmarket shopping malls and chic restaurants, there's widespread drug-related crime, desperately poor housing, and a high incidence of arson. Almost half of the city's investigative fires are suspicious. The men and women of the city's fire department are constantly on the go. Their fire, rescue and medic squads are the busiest in the world. This is a story of their frontline activities on the streets of fire. We can be sitting in the kitchen eating dinner and 30 seconds later, we can be riding up the street, see smoke in the air. You know that you're going to have a working fire somewhere when you get there. When you get a call, it's not too bad. But when you see the smoke, that's when your adrenaline gets born. Then you get really pumped up. You know, it's like, we got one, we got one, we got one. And uh, it's a general rush. It's like the feeling before a football game or something like that. Teams known throughout the city to be the busiest and the best in the whole city. We have a good crew. Everybody gets along well. It's like a brotherhood here. Here we go. Being a rookie, I'm still thinking about everything I got to do. You know, my all my clothes on tight. You know, that kind of stuff. With those guys who've been in for 10, 20 years, it's second nature. You know, I mean, they still get the, the adrenaline rush, but probably not as much as it is with me. It's still all new to me. I pull up and see the fire, I'm like, wow. I love the job. Uh, I love the excitement. Uh, the danger is always there in the back of my mind as a caution. But 
if I think if I start to dwell too much on the danger, I really don't think I could do the job. We will pull up to a row of houses. Uh, the worst scenario are vacant houses where the windows are all boarded up. Uh, these fires are particularly hard to fight because the companies almost have to try to cut the fire off in the roof line before it extends possibly for the entire block. <laughs> There are over 11,000 vacant houses in Baltimore, and many of them are used by drug dealers and users. In Baltimore City, there are about 50% of the fires that we investigate, that we go out on, are intentionally set. Our job is to go out and determine the origin of fire, that is, where the fire started, the exact location of it, and the cause. Do what you can in this building here. Get it open. You got a truck man with a hook. These bills got a hook. Billy, Bill, when you get up there, get the seal. Oh, I will. Okay. Okay. All right. Are you Where the water? Right, 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 right there, here. They got a line in the back. I got a line. A line in here. Got fire in that, that area right there. Hand the line down here. The only resident still living in this street, Kim Thomas, is reluctant to leave. Bring the line down here and stop it before it spreads down the block. It's spread already from down, down to this building. Open up there too. Further down. Oh my goodness. The last fire that started from a kid was up this end. But usually when the fire starts down here is a drug user that runs in. They they pull cars up from they don't even live this around this area. They come from down this end, come up here, and they go in one of these houses or this one on the corner and they shoot up. Monday I came to out the block Monday morning. They was in this yard right here with needles in their arm, and I'm sick of it. I have children myself, even though they are grown, but I have children myself. Okay. But I don't want to see this, and I don't want to deal with this. I'm sick of this. Well, every we... other day, or every, if it ain't happening on a Monday or Tuesday, it's on a Friday or a Saturday, a fire is in this block. Well, we'll try. I'm just sick of it. But without you know, anybody saying, hey, I saw who was in the building or anything, it's tough to find out you know, who's, who's in the building. Especially if it's a lot of transient people moving in and out and it's not the same people. Yeah, but I'm the only one that lives in this block. I'm the only one. Okay, right back there, yeah. I get a lot of satisfaction if I'm with the pipe when I go in there. You know, I got the lieutenant right behind me and tell me what to do and I'll put it out. You know, it's just me and the fire and it's like, I'll put the whole thing out. And afterwards, you know, it's, it's like you look around and see everything is burnt. It's like, wow, you know, <laughs> it was neat. <laughs> we try to get there as quick as we can. You get there early enough in the early stages of fire, you can rely on your own eyes and senses as to what's happening and what happened. 
A lot of times we go into the fire while it's still burning. We look from the areas of least burning to the areas of most burning. And this will generally lead us to the point of origin. There are 60,000 fires in the city each year. Suspected arsons are investigated by a dedicated team of eight officers. Okay, basically, we know it started in here, but we're going to wait till they get done putting out the rest of this, and then we'll clean up the floor and take a look and see what was burned. As you can tell, this house had a lot of debris in it. From being vacant, people just piled trash in here. You might have had drug addicts here, maybe homeless living here. And uh, in this particular block, if I'm not mistaken, this is the third fire we've had in the last two weeks. Many times we'll get through the V pattern, the fire will burn up this way and this way. Now looking at this thing here, the way this is, this thing is coning down from here and coning down from here. Sometimes flammable liquids show that. Now as we look in this second room, which was the bathroom, we can see that it looks like it was a second point of ignition in this place. There were two, two fires set. That fire did not take off like the one in the other room did. That one looks like it was minor in nature. There's some more burns. Just try, even with the toilet tape, because I want to see that burn pattern get, on that back get wall. Let me get that for a minute. Yeah. You have to take everything into consideration. If it's you had a fire in this block and it was the first fire and there's drug needles laying around, it's possible the people were in there doing their drug, whatever, cooking their drugs or smoking their drugs and accidentally set it. But when you get a series of fires, which we've had in this block, and you get two separate points of origin in here, then you know that the fire was set. It's not a matter of, you know, one person accidentally dropping a cigarette, because what do you do, accidentally drop it here and walk in the other room and drop it in there, too? It's an adventure. Everybody wants to come to 13. 13 is a big one because it's always the busiest year in, year out, and we get a lot of fire. And all of us are young, and we're all go-getters, and it's, it's a good shift here. There are 60 fire appliances serving the streets of Baltimore, but one of them is unique. It's called Rescue One, and it specializes in freeing trapped people. Rescue One, well, it's different. I mean, when you think of firefighting, you don't think of rescue. You think of uh, ladder companies, uh, engine companies with hose. But rescue work is it's a little different. We work as a team. You run in different situations, and uh, you rely on each other. Not one person has the right idea all the time. You know, and we put our heads together and try and solve the problem. Police officer Todd Haslip was on his way to help a colleague who was under attack. Here, get the other tool. All right, you take over. I want the roof off. Where's Dave at? I'll tell you, like I said, we're going to take this roof off. We'll lay that seat back. Take your time. No, it ain't done. Give me a seatbelt cutter. Danny, cut that other seatbelt on the other side. We'll be ready to roll. Hey, Bez. Yeah, watch it. Go ahead. Yeah, go. Hey, Cap. We're going to roll this roof in a minute. All right. Fab you out in a minute, babe. How you doing, Bez? All right. What do you got? One more cut, Dave? over here. OK. OK, you can take that sheet off his head. How you doing, Bez? Bob, we're going forward? Yeah, we're going forward with this. All right, let's go. Roll it over. All right. Okay. Dave, get a cutter in here. I want to cut this seat. I'm going to lay it back. 
Hey, buddy, what's your name? Todd, my leg. I can't move my leg. I know. I can't move this one at all. I know. Hey, hey you're going to be all right. No, it's there. That's why we're going through all this extra precaution. You're going to be fine, OK? Watch your back. Just hang in there with us. We'll have you out here in a minute. I can't, I can't see move. Move. Just stay still. He's moving. I know it hurts, buddy. All right, let's put a steady pressure on this and bend it back. All right, get that. OK, get that backboard under him. I got his neck. OK, Danny, talk to me. I know, brother. Hey, hey, Dan. Take it up. He's be laying on all his shit when we get him on the board. Why don't we cut his belt off, Danny? You know what you're doing there? OK, just take your time, do it. OK, officer. Take those trauma shears, cut that belt. All right, bend that seat a little bit more, if you can. Just put steady pressure. All right. I wish we could get it further. That's, that's all right. It's good enough. Okay. All right. That's all stuff. Just be as gentle as you can. I'm going to. All right, let's go. Want to count of three? One, two, three. Let's go. Tilt that board up. Lay the board Get the board up. Pivot it. Slide him back. Okay. You got it. We're in good shape. Okay. Okay. Here we go. We're in. All right. Can you lay this leg flat? Let's take our time. Got a blanket or a pillow or anything? I got the leg, Danny. If you want to do what you want to do. Get some support it. Yeah. Okay. Let's get another one under there. Cause whatever we got. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's why I let you guys call them shots. Well, you know, we work hand in glove on this, Dan. Exactly. Hey, Bez. Up off the trunk, we'll slide him back to you. Yeah, just yeah, this one right here. Up. Right in here. It's supported. Take your time. You got it. You got him. And there was a taxi cab. He was trying to make the right turn. I was trying to make the left. And as I was making this left turn, this part I don't know where the police car come from. He hit me, and he hit that pole. Our main concerns for that officer is that the car is secondary here. Fairly good crash, though. I can't see what he hit. It really it looks bad, but it was a minor accident. Rescue One is uh, it's a strange company, because you never know what you're going to get. Right, get the jaws. We're going to take the trunk open up so they can get in there and get the stuff out. Best got, got it. it. We get a lot of elevator calls. In fact, I'm thinking about changing my name to Otis, because <laughs> we do get a ton of them. Just a lot of off-the-wall things that you would get. I mean, we've had people fall off the toilet seats and get wedged between the tub and the toilet, and you have to go in and take, take it apart to get them out. So you, you never know what you're going to run across. And uh, some sad things and some quite humorous. Hey, officer, was he playing the back nine or the front nine? <laughs> He forgot the hour four. I don't even know where to know how they got in there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, officer. We're going to throw that roof back on here, too. OK. Another satisfied customer. A few blocks from downtown Baltimore is Old Town Fire Station. It's the base for the world's busiest ambulance, Medic 7. Medic 7, respond 501 McElderry Court for an obstetrics patient. Medic 7, respond 501 McElderry Court, an obstetrics patient. Incident 1502, acknowledge Medic 7, 1620. This is kind of like a shorter version of a nurse. We call ourselves road doctors. You have your days when you have to be a social worker, a drug counselor, a mother, a father, just a guidance counselor, anything. The thing that I really like most about this job is never the same. Even though people say, well, oh, you're a paramedic, you see it all every day, each individual case is different from the other. It's just a broad job. You do a whole lot. It's not limited. He just said she's sick. All right, I'll be up. A woman is bleeding in a bathroom. Kind of tight coming in. Yeah. Right. 
she's in the bathroom. And make sure she's decent. She's not decent. Oh, OK. How far gone are you? Six months. So she complained of hemorrhaging? Yeah. OK. So how long, how long ago did you start um, hemorrhaging, bleeding? This morning, about what time? Eight, nine, seven? Um, nine, or ten. nine or ten. You take any medicines for anything? Uh, okay, you're allergic to any medicines? Ampersilla. Ampersilla? All right. I'm trying to get some cheese, Carrie. You got, can you get something loose for her to slip on? Something she loose. Need, she needs, she needs, she needs. Does she have, um, no, she no. have like some no, like a, sweatpants? Long, Do you have pants. sweatpants? Or, uh, something no, long, a robe, anything. Well, find me something old, Joe. Hey, we don't want you to fall off the bed. Hi. Don't look in none of my drawers. You know I wear this stuff in the drawer. Give me anything in there for you. Let's go. Come on. Put that All right, on. I get her here. You take the baby. Come on. Come on, show her. Come on. There you go. Come on. Come on. All right, sweetie. Is it always there? Mm-hmm. Vera has recovered the fetus and placed it in a supermarket carrier bag. 100 over 60, you say? Okay, she that's complained cool. of business, so. I have her. She's on wheels. Don't worry. Okay, all right. So make sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. That's what I'm here for. Just don't even help. hurt yourself. For us, teamwork is very important. And we get along fairly well, and it's good to have a good working relationship with your partner. So even if you don't like them that much, you still need to learn to like to work with them. You have that bond, I guess you can say that. It's easy if you do like each other, and it's easy if you do get along with one another. I have to rely upon her to do things that I can't do. The better we do with working together, the quicker we can get someone to the hospital, the quicker we can save How old are you? 25. 25. You say you have three kids? Yeah. Were they um, natural birth or cesarean or anything like that? Natural. natural. Full term? Vaginal? Yes. Vaginal and full term? Yes. Any miscarriages or abortions? Abortions. What, what pregnancy is this for you? Six. Seven. How, okay, so how many? Four abortions? Three abortions. Three abortions. I'm sorry. Three abortions. Is that before or after your kids? In between or? One before, in between. Okay. And after. I'm gonna put some oxygen on you. If it starts to burn, let me know, okay? Mm -hmm. Are you having complications all along throughout this pregnancy? No. So you woke up today, hemorrhaging? I was asleep and I, um, it woke me up. Okay. Later on, do you think you can tell me what the baby was? It, was? it was difficult for us to tell by the eye, but the doctor probably can tell, okay? It wasn't. Was it fully formed? Cause I couldn't hold it. It looked tell. almost fully formed to me, but, but it was. It was just it difficult. Was, to I tell. really couldn't tell, and okay. I just picked it up. I really didn't check it. check to see. Do you think he was? How long? How long was the baby dead? It was small. Very very. I, it's, small. it's hard to say how long it passed. I, we so, we're not experts in that field. So he could have been dead any for weeks. I'm not certain. It, he could have. I mean, if, if it was passed away already, but he could have been. But, you know, it's really hard for us to determine that because, mm -hmm. you know, you weren't getting prenatal care or yeah, anything. Yeah, I just so. want to know, have that ever happened to anybody who had a baby? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Even full term, you know, who go the whole nine months could die and they could still be it within a month. And usually they determine that when they listen to a heartbeat. That's why they do sonograms and mm -hmm. heart, you know, listen to their heartbeats and stuff like that. Once you're performing your duty, you don't really have a chance to get emotional until afterwards you think about it. Right then and there, in the moment, the only thing that you're thinking about is what you can do best for this patient is more of a challenge than anything. It has been times where certain calls have stuck with me and I've actually cried on a couple, but it goes away after a while.
get a great number of calls that people don't understand what the problem is. They've called their landlord. They can't get anything from the landlord. Uh, their last resort is to always call the fire department if they're having a trouble with their stove, uh, with some of their plumbing. If the roof's leaking, they call for us. Turn out. We're the last resort. When people can't get help anywhere else, they'll call the fire department because they know no matter what, that somebody will come and at least attempt to uh, solve the problem for them. She had an order leak this morning. It did. It wasn't like that this morning. Oh, and now it's done burned through. It looked like it done burned through the ceiling. Uh, you don't have to have a ladder, do you? I do. Right there. Dear, great. I'll see you on hook. In the box. Well, no, I can use a screwdriver. And just, you're going to have to let's take turn a, the power off. ladder first. Then we'll take a look. How's it going to? See where it looks uh -huh. like it burned down I through? I can't imagine what we're going to do. Just, uh, no, it's just running through this. It's just running up through the ceiling. That's all. I'm just going to said there was water yeah, leaking down through it. Jump up there and see what's up there. Here, take it. Do you want to shut the power off? Yeah, sit half of it in the bathroom. Do you want to hit the power off? I want to see what it looks like up there. Take that. In case you have to poke around the drywall. Yeah, it's burnt. It is a wire. Uh, what is that? I know. It looks like a, like a mushroom or something. A what? Yeah. See it? It's a plant. So look like at that. <laughs> you have plant life in your ceiling. You got a plant growing. Is that what that is? Not yeah, it. There it comes. Come down. Mm. <laughs> it looked like it's a wire. Mushroom. It didn't yep. burn a whole exactly what it is. No, 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 no. no it's it's a just mushroom. the water. Oh. The water leak caused the separation the in the paint, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. it just the mushroom was growing above the ceiling, and it just happened in the right spot where the crack developed that the mushroom fell through. Okay. But that's all it was. Okay. Okay. I said it wasn't an emergency. I That's all right. I've never had a mushroom. <laughs> no vegetation there in the ceiling. Yeah. What are you doing down on this side of town? You're using not on this side. You're using this side. Which hospital did you just come out of, Robert? I'm University. University? All right. They're going to love to see you again. I'm going to put the blind. I need to get on your arms so I can help you stand up. You got to stand up. That's the only way you're going to get on the stretcher. There you go. Just see him. When's the last time you had a drink? Yesterday. Yesterday? Yesterday. Yesterday. Can you give me the blanket? Yeah, yeah I'm going to take you care of you. Put your feet down. Put your feet down. Put your feet down. Put your feet down. Oh, that hurt. Can you put the blanket okay. on? Okay, how old are you now? 53? I'll be 64. 64. June the 21st. What are you going to the hospital for earlier today? For? Drinking. Drinking? So you haven't had anything to drink today? No, ma'am. Oh. Oh. Oh, God. All right. Four miles away, Rescue One is on call again this time to release a man trapped under a car. The man and his wife had been in an argument, and she ran him over. Both he and the car rolled down an embankment. Bob Wagner is in charge. I guess we all pray. If it's going to happen, let it happen on our shift. If it was a rescue, we want to handle it. Just use the This is going to be tight, OK? okay huh? I know that sounds strange, but it's in our blood like that. Jimmy, you want to check his back? Yeah. Okay. Deep breath again. He's complaining of med sternal. One more. Thank you. We do have a lot of competition between the shifts. We want to outdo the other shifts and vice versa. So that's good. You need that competition. Okay, ready? Okay, go ahead. Keep holding traction yeah. on this thing. Let's grab the cutter right here. No. Was he in the car, Bob? Or no. No. He was a little no. walker. Okay. All right. Look, right. move.
Police officers told the woman she would be charged with attempted murder and she collapsed. Six-year-old Stephen was in the car with his mother. Give her a little kiss. I go with her. Take give give your mom a little kiss. I go with her. Come here, come here, look, look. Come here, buddy. No. Come here, listen, look, look. There you go, buddy. I think when children are involved, it, it really is an emotional situation for all of us. Uh, go all out for little kids. Not that you don't for adults, but children, you know, just haven't had a chance at life. And uh, it's, it's always tough when you have a child involved in an accident. A lot of times, if you talk to them in a calm manner, you can uh, reassure them that everything's going to be okay. And they need that because it's a traumatic situation there. because you don't know what you're coming up against. Generations are getting younger and younger. You have 13, 14-year-olds stabbing, shooting each other. So definitely, the streets are getting more dangerous. People are not as friendly as they used to be. There's definitely more guns, along with a different type of ammunition. They're shooting with bigger guns. It's just a different type of mentality. Once we arrive on the scene of an incident, if it's a shooting, we definitely need to know if it's a safe scene before you go into the scene. Uh, we try to have police on the scene. If there aren't, then we'll try to back off. I've been caught up in an instance where the shooter was still there and they threatened us because they don't want their person that they shot to be treated. Um, so we definitely have to make sure the scene is safe and then we treat the um, patient the best we can and get out of there. How old are you? Okay, come on, baby. Uh -huh. Look at me for it, please. Yeah, because he got shot right in the middle. Dennis Rogers. R O G E R S? Yes. Where you live at, Dennis? Where you live? What's the address? We're going to lay you on your back, okay? I got you. Lay the boy okay. flat. Uh, uh, Slide him down. Uh, Perfect. Put your hands on your belt. I'm fine. I got you. Dennis was one of six shooting victims in the city today. Any, any patient that's shot is considered serious because we don't know whether the bullet traveled up, down, or whether it even come out. 
Um, if the patient is more critical, we do a rapid assessment, number one, and then we turn around and do a full assessment inside the ambulance while we're en route to the hospital along with treatment. We have to remove all the clothing to actually count how many bullet holes where, see if there are any entrance and exit wounds. Sometimes you have to take your hand and swipe underneath the patient. Maybe if you come out with some blood, there might be a wound there. You, you, that could be a gunshot wound somewhere you know you, you don't see. Um, you want to give them fluids because most of the time if they aren't bleeding in, outside, they're bleeding inside. We're going to give you some of this, OK? That's the best we can, we can do, OK? OK. OK. You're going to be OK. I got shot. Huh? I got shot. Do you remember what kind of gun it was? Uh, you lay down. I got this. Uh, uh, you don't know what kind of gun it was? Uh, ouch! Ouch! I know. Always. You know, kind of. All right, then. We gotta we take this off arm. too, okay? You are. Uh, you lay flat. Uh, Honestly, one inches at this time. What you're gonna do is have to strip them off and flip them. You understand what I'm saying? Who's that outside? Your mom? Okay. What were you doing when you got shot? Running, walking? I was outside, outside, outside. Um, my cousin, um, somebody was trying to take my dick, right? Uh huh. I was trying to take um, something that was fighting. You hope still. My cousin, um, my cousin made the mistake and shot me. Can you cut these? So your cousin outside? made the mistake and shot you. Yeah. Mom was up forward and seat belted in. All right. Okay. Uh, Who's handling? I'll find out in a second. Okay. So you know what kind of gun it was? No. Was it a big gun, little gun? Like a 22 or a 25? Uh, Relax. What you need to do is stop panicking, OK? We're going to give you an IV. You can't put anything in your mouth. When was the last time you had something to eat? Early when I was in school. OK, what time was that, about 12 o'clock? 11.30. 11.30 was your last meal? Yes. OK. We got a woman with chest pains over here. Give Ain't a thing I can do. Medic. Call another medic. Uh, we can't take I'll it. put her on out to a while. Okay. Oh, hair up here. You're doing right, fine. You in one sec. So it hurts right there on your belly. Yes. What about your back? Oh, it hurt my back. Let me have this on, all right? In your pelvis area. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's see. Roll you over. Roll can out? you roll over to your right side for me? No, you're What's right. Up? You're right. right. Towards the wall. So just so I can see. Looks good. Yeah, no, I don't see an exit. Uh, OK, and cover him back up. Where's he head at, the stomach? Yeah, the groin area. You're doing good, Dennis. You got this stuff down some. One more, you want, you want at the top? It's burning your nose? Go with okay. it. Yeah, that's good. Please, put your legs down, sweetheart. We're going right, to go over to. You want me back? You want me back here with you? Yes. He's fine. I'm right here. I'm going to okay. be with you, OK? Just let me know where you I'm right here. Listen, you can't have any water. What you're going to have to do is you get in the IV. That's the best we can do, OK? You can't have anything for your throat right this second. Uh, hold on for a minute. Hey. One second. One second. One second. One second only. His cousin shot him by I know, mistake. I know, I know. I need to get his name. What's his name? Dennis Rogers. Hopkins, this where is, is City That's 7. Where's your name? Where's your cousin shot him? Right, he's we Dennis are. Rogers. On What's location with a 15-year-old black male, approximately yes. 75 kilos. Um, Patients, chief two, complaint. He has two, a gunshot two, wound yeah, to the groin right, area. He shot you, right? Yes, yeah, right. he shot both of them. Okay, all right. He lives at 202 East Lafayette. Yeah. That would be the left right. groin area. You the grandma, the mother? Yes, I'm his okay. grandmother biological, but I adopted okay. him legally. Are we ready? Yeah, yeah go, go ahead. Go Wait a minute. Go yeah, go ahead. Be advised, the only history that the patient has is that of scoliosis. He has no loss of consciousness. Um, he's complaining of pain to his left rear back area, the kidney area. Is that your mom? Your grandma? She's up the front, OK? Be advised, he does have um, pulses, good capillary refill. And he is able to move all extremities. Do you copy? Oh, it's the bumps hurt my stomach. The bumps hurt my stomach. You, it's no way around it. Hopkins, can you repeat your last transmission? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, look at that fool. Oh, my God. This is absolutely oh. 
nice uh, and soft. Uh, it's uh, uh, like the normal lemons. It's not hard or anything. Uh, I'm a like, this is crazy as he want to be. He heard you coming. He heard, he heard us coming. coming. He had to see us. He heard us coming. Yeah, that should have been good enough. However you can get comfortable is fine, but you cannot come off the stretcher, OK? So scoot back down, son. That's you, you twisting all around, OK? So you can't lose but so much because we're trying to go to the hospital. You don't have on that belt, which you need on. But I'll let you take that off, OK? So you can be comfortable. Yeah, why don't you lay on the side that's not shot? There you go. The ride to the hospital is like keeping the patient calm, letting them know that they're doing good, um, they're breathing fine. You're coming along, you are shot, but, you know, take a deep breath if you feel pain this way or that way. Just trying to keep the patient with you. If you feel like they're going off, call their name a couple of times, you know, stay with me. You're en route to the hospital. You got to kind of let the patient know what's going on. So your cousin made a mistake and shot you? Yes. OK. So it was his gun. He was trying to shoot somebody else? Yes. And, and aimed it at you by mistake? Yeah, he was swinging it around. Oh, he was swinging it around? No. Oh, make sure you tell the police that, OK? Because yeah. guns are nothing to play with. Now you kind of understand that theory, yeah. right? Uh, no. Yeah. No joke. I can't breathe. My stomach can't breathe. You can't breathe? No. What I want you to do is breathe through your nose. Breathe in. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. We have something to make you breathe a lot easier. Breathe in through your nose. That burning in your nose is the oxygen we were telling you about. That's good for you. It just feels crazy because you're going backwards. You're not used to laying on this type of bed, OK? We're yeah. here now, OK? Uh, Can you please lay on your back? Uh, uh, Just relax. Uh, oh, I can't. I know it hurts. It burns a whole lot. It burns good. You already did that. Here's your grandma, OK? Uh, Want to say uh, bye to your grandma uh, before you uh, go to the back? Yes. OK, talk to your grandson before we take him back. Listen, listen, turn around. I'm on the phone. Here you are, honey. Listen to me, okay? Uh, I'm going to take you home. What grandma told you? Who is you? You hold on to God. That's Listen right. You. Uh, Hello. Make sure my parents can come in and see me. I'm there. I got it. Everybody goes. Got multiple calls for a building file on North Avenue. generally our job to try to gain access, get in as close to the sea of the fire as we can and extinguish it as quickly as we can. Sometimes that's just not possible. There are times when the fire has gained too much headway. In these cases, we're forced to do what we call a defensive mode, where we basically are trying to contain the fire and prevent it from extending to any other buildings in the area. Usually, in most of the fires, you get there confined to one room, but then they'll spread to another one. But when they got here, the fire had completely consumed the entire second floor, as if something was used to accelerate the fire. Now, in order for that fire to spread, it would have to go through the doorway, down a hallway, into another room, and so forth, as you go to the front of the building. But this had the fire coming out of every window, every room on that second floor. And the time of the fire, it's at 7.30 in the morning, which is uh, basically rush hour traffic, people going to work. It's on a major thoroughfare, north, south, east, west, people coming into the city and traveling across the city. 
if it had been a smaller fire and started slow and been smoldering, smoke would have been seen. More than likely, somebody would have called. You have a telephone booth right in front of the building. If somebody would have saw it, all they have to do is pick it up, dial 911, and they get in touch with the operator. The way it sounds, everything happened all at once, which means it had to be an incendiary. Potentially so. Move, move to your right some more. To your right, that's it. Right in there, that looks good. There you go, you're getting it. Okay, keep pouring it in there, a little higher if you can. That's it. Look at that steel little on the right side of the building. That's the only thing holding that wall up right now, and there's very few bricks under it. It's very possible that front wall is going to come down. Okay, it looks like a wall from there. Shut it down, it's back up. Help! Well, now I'm going to get something to drink. Gentlemen, are you ready to get something to drink? Huh? Now, as we go up, we'll see if we can get a better view from the top to get some burn pattern somewhere, see how it's burnt. Looking at the building next door, if you look, you still have some plaster on the walls on the front. So that didn't burn away completely. It looks like the fire started somewhere on that second floor near the rear of this building and jumped into the other building. The problem we have right now is that we have a three-story building and it's all sitting on the first floor. So when a roof came in, the wall from the second building fell on top of it. So we even had debris from the second building covering our our roof and point of origin area. A building like this, too, you don't want to risk firefighters' lives. On a vacant building that's in bad constructional condition, with heavy fire conditions, you don't want to put men in the building or you're going to get them killed. If the men were inside the building, the building would have fallen on them. So we consider ourselves lucky. Kim Thomas's house was so badly damaged in the fire, she was rehoused by the city. Todd Haslop, the trapped policeman, has undergone three leg operations. Doctors believe he may never be able to return to patrol work. The woman who miscarried is now well and back at home. The wife who ran over her husband was charged with attempted first-degree murder and is now awaiting trial. Teenager Dennis Rogers left the hospital after three weeks and several operations. He's made a full recovery. We'll be back on the streets of fire again next Thursday on 4.
violence and drugs, you can write a thousand books on that here. It's, 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 it's a lot. There's a lot of it here. In Baltimore City, there are about 50% of the fires that we investigate, that we go out on, are intentionally set. Every year in Baltimore City, the 911 calls are increasing. The numbers are getting higher. The 18 medic units are getting busier and busier. And a lot of it is because of the poverty is getting worse and worse. I've been in the city four years, and I've had over 100 shootings where either the patient was deceased upon my arrival or we transported them to the hospital. In Baltimore City, the murder rate is the fourth highest in America. Fire department medic Sherry Luck and Vera Thompson are just one unit in a team of 1,700 medics and firefighters who are among the busiest in the world. They aim to respond to calls in just 90 seconds. This time, it's a shooting but they're beaten to it by their colleagues who are passing in Medic 16. Medic 7 and 16 going to take the patient. God damn it, they right there. Shit, what they dispatch us for and they all the way up here? So stupid. What's 16? Who's on 16? Oh, no, Where's 16? Is he handling it or what? I don't know. Shit, well, he should handle the patient. So you got this Gordon? You got it, Gordon? You, no, you, you can't it. handle it if you right. the assessing. Shit. You got it. I'm going to get your stretcher. Medic seven. Seven. I would imagine 16 is going to handle this. He's um, working with the patient, OK? We're going to stand by for a couple of minutes, OK? Seven. In the past three days that I've been on, I've had three shootings, one a day. This gentleman is very critical. Uh, right off from looking at him, I knew right away he wasn't doing good. He was very diaphoretic, sweaty, uh, labored breathing, where the gunshot wounds were indicated, one in the chest, it's in vital organs, lung, uh, spleen, stomach, liver could have been hit. Also could have hit gallbladder. Those are large organs, a lot of blood loss. Keep that on there. Keep that on there. Yeah, don't be breathing a little bit. Okay. 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 He was sitting in his car, and I guess somebody came up and shot him. We get quite a bit of shootings, especially the east side of town. It's somewhat violent. Ready? The medics are employed by the fire department, and their ambulances are based at the fire stations. They work closely alongside the firefighters, and every fire officer has paramedic training, too. Between them, they've seen it all. Sherry and Vera have been working together for two years. They see woundings like this constantly. 46 people in every 100,000 will be shot or stabbed to death this year. It seems that shootings and other type of violence in the city, they have a certain pattern. At the beginning of the month, we'll see a lot of drug overdoses. I guess people get their checks, their money. In the middle of the month, we'll have assaults, people getting beat up. I don't know if they owe money or they upset someone or whatever. Towards the end of the month, we have, I guess you could call almost uh, retaliatory shootings. We'll have a shooting uh, on one block, and maybe a day later, two blocks over from the one shooting, we'll have another shooting. It seems, you know, paybacks, it, eye for an eye. You want to get an EKG on him? I'll get the line. You got a line set up? Yeah, he's got huge veins. Yeah, I see him. What's your name, boss? Line. Open it up. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is, but shootings, three in three days, four, you could have two uh, in one night, and they're all basically in the same area. You go to one side of town and they're located in one area, another side of town, it's a couple square blocks, and that's how the shootings patterns are. Sharps are on the floor. Four by fours. Hold on, hold on. Just 
wrap it around because he's real diaphoretic. EMRC, EMRC, Baltimore City, Medic 16, EMRC. You ready? Yeah. All right, let's tell me. Priority one trauma receiving Hopkins. How old are you? Okay, go to Med 2, please, Med 2. Going to 2. Hopkins City 16, we're en route to your location with the male uh, gunshot wound. We have one gut gunshot wound to the right flank, uh, one to the abdomen, and also one to the left leg. Physical findings are as follows, BP 110 by pal pulse of 50, respirations are uh, 22 and labored. Uh, unable to assess good lung sounds. Treatment so far is 0290, 100% non-rebreather. We have two IVs of ringers established running wide open. EKG is showing a sinus bradycardia rhythm. Rate approximately 50. ETA in your facility is going to be two minutes. Do you copy? Okay. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Ready? Yep. Forty-six fire stations serve Baltimore's population of 670,000, who rely heavily on its 911 system. Half of them call it every year. In the middle of it all is Station 13, located in what's known locally as the Wild West. The firefighters and medics here are among the busiest in the world. Engine 13, turn out. We got a report of a fire on Bennett Place. Report of a fire on Bennett Place. My father was a lieutenant in the city fire department for 37 years. Uh, he had tried to talk me for a number of years into coming in, and at first I was reluctant because I didn't think I would like the work. Eventually I took the test, came in, and I think the only regret that I've had since then is that I didn't come in four or five years sooner when I could have. Before I was born, actually, my mother's father died in a basement fire back in 1961. And uh, a lot of people asked my mom if it bothers her having two sons and a husband in the fire department. And she says it doesn't bother her at all, and she doesn't have a gray hair on her body, so I guess I believe her. <laughs> Here, fires broken out in a child's bedroom. <laughs> A lot of people think the job's glamorous. Uh, they see us riding around in a big fire truck, or they have a picture of us you know, going up and down. What they don't see is the middle of summer uh, going to a fire and uh, becoming sick to our stomachs from the heat and humidity because of uh, all the work we're doing. Within four minutes of arriving at the scene, the fire's been extinguished. The flames have already destroyed the bedroom and left serious smoke damage throughout the house. The cause? A child playing with matches. During the overhaul process, the building still has a very high humidity content from the water that we sprayed. We're inside working conditions, uh, maybe 120, 130 degrees. This process can be very tiring. It really takes a lot out of you. I'd be in a fire, fighting a fire. I mean, I'd be, I'd, I mean, I'd be gasping, you know, side hurting, getting the cramps and everything. 
Honestly, Ted Novak, who's you know twice my age, yeah, he's still going around like there's barely even breathing hard. I'm like, I'm supposed to be the young one here. I'm really supposed to be the one that's in shape here. This summer, 250 Baltimore firefighters were treated for heat exhaustion. 13 were hospitalized. Back at base, Vera and Sherry have been called out again. Huh. Cardiac in the arm, probably defending. We get called names. People tell us we're walking too slow, rush up, hurry up. It doesn't bother me um, verbally at all. They work closely as a team in often hostile circumstances. You just do what you have to do. If you have to call on the police, the police work very, very well with us. If we call on a scene for one of uh, the paramedics or even a citizen that's just, you know, being disruptive, um, I, I would just use my best judgment, try not to use violence. They're often in danger and patients can be abusive too. I can kind of deal with it because I grew up in the city and before I even, you know, uh, got into EMS, I, I grew up around it, so I can kind of deal with it, I can kind of cope with it. Brush it off if it's nothing serious and just go on with the next call. This call is to the local courthouse. A man has discharged himself from hospital despite serious stab wounds. Are you going to church home? Yes. Okay. Just have a seat. Take your time. His sister-in-law is about to appear in court charged with trying to kill him with a toasting fork, but he wants to tell the court it was an accident. Oh, ah! Okay. So Larry, you have no business being out of that hospital. We'll get it easy. Someone at the courthouse dialed 911. Unfortunately, his wound has turned nasty. And so has he. I'm ready. Okay. You ready, Sherry? Well, Just you. cut on the master switch and cut off the lights. Okay. Oh, what? Well. Good. That's fine. Fuck the walls. Huh? Who in the fuck called that one? I have no idea. But you don't have to curse me out for trying to help you, do you? Okay. Look at it. See how it's oozing on your under on your shirt there? All red. Don't that hurt? It's all swollen. It hurts. He already told me it's gonna hurt for cough. Right. It's gonna hurt if I gotta pass gas. Right. And if I go to the bathroom, the thing I'm gonna take me a good one. It's gonna hurt. Right. Question, Mr. Larry. Mr. Larry, did they have to take any of, like, your bowel out or anything? Hopkins cut me unnecessarily. So my question is, did they take out part I of your bowel? I got stabbed here in the abdomen right. with a fork. Right. Hopkins had low right going all the way up. OK. Did you, did you, did they take out an organ? Or? They didn't take out nothing. OK, so were you stabbed They sold your... my liver. OK, so you injured your liver. And my stomach. OK. Ask me why they made extra surgery on me, because I don't know. Oh. Hopkins is a butcher. OK. And within 24 hours, they took 48 gold of blood from me. And they even went down in my motherfucking IV needle. This shit hurt my liver so fucking bad, I woke up crying. And they treated me like a motherfucking pain cushion. Mm. OK. Hey, throw this damn driver. Watch where you go. They going to tell me about alcohol. What am I going in here for? Because you swole just church hospital. You ain't want to go to Hopkins, right? So we had to take you to church hospital. No blood. They ain't gonna have to take blood that I know of. But you can tell them all of that when you get in there, okay? This is a good hospital. They real nice over here. How you doing? He's a um gentleman who was stabbed last week, and they um did some surgery on him at Hopkins. He walked out of Hopkins without signing out, and he's, um, you know, more or less infection. You don't have to put, move put you in our bed right here. Well, I got okay. some more rookies. Some rookies? 
I don't think so. They not rookies. They the nice people. Oh, good job. I can't stand no rookies. No, she ain't no rookie by far. She got some, 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 she's a veteran. Yeah? Yeah. Can you get over there? If not, we'll move you over there. You want us to pull you over? Oh, we do oh, it we all day. Handle. We do it all day. You want to handle these pains, man. All right. Okay, righty. well, take your time, then. Yes, sir. Just hold this. Okay, oh, I got, got this. You. Good job. You got to bend your knees. Just a little bit. Just a No, I'm not. You can handle it. Put this foot over. How you get out the hospital in all this pain? I know. Hey, the buddy you sucked it up like a man, huh? Well, fuck, I could they wasn't pulled up. All right, okay, man. Yeah. Only thing they know people give me. No, oh, OK. Didn't tell me I had to wash my own ass. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Scoot over. I told him real quick, kiss him my ass. I, I believe it. I believe right. it. You want to lay in one spot. A little bit more. Good right, job. I'm going to put the bar up. And that'll Good job. Good. Keep still. Put your arm right there. There you go. They wanted me to lay in one spot. Well, all right. Nice meeting you. If I had to go bathroom. You ain't going to give me your handshake? <laughs> Stay in here. Let these people take <laughs> care of you. <laughs> That's too far? Drop that. Oh, drop that. Drop that. Down? Drop that. A little more. A little bit more. How's that? Good. All right, nice meeting you here. All right. Let them, people, let them people take care of you here. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to kiss you on your glove. All right. You and your partner. Took care of you, right? Ever had. All right, thanks. Well, you let them take care of you, OK? And don't act crazy, all right? Let get out of here tonight. All right, don't worry about that. You just let them take care of you, OK? I get out of here. All right. See you later. Elsewhere in the city, there's a call out for rescue expert Hoot Gibson and his team, Rescue One. I think what's special about Rescue One is the variety that you get. You really see the worst of everything. And that's what makes pretty much this job so exciting. If it's anything that big going on or just anything that's really off the wall, we're going to be there. We're in the backyard. Hey, he's pinned on the, on the passenger side right there. Okay. Hoot Gibson's speciality is freeing trapped people. The stolen car has crashed and three of the occupants have run away. A fourth man is trapped inside. When we arrive, there are companies already on the scene, maybe a medic unit or an engine company or truck company. My first job when I arrive on the scene is to see the overall picture, the way the car is sitting, what it's up against, whether or not electric lines are involved, anything that could be hazardous to any phase of the operation. I assess the situation. I find out where the victim's trapped, how seriously they're injured, and then I have to look around and see what's going on because there's a lot of things that have to take place before the rescue even starts. My senior man grab whatever extrication tools I need, and one man will have the spreaders, one man will have the cutters. They'll start cutting the roof. One man will use a saw to cut the windshield out, and every man specifically has a job. Huh? Yeah, that's what I'm going to try. Scotty, let me try spreading it from here. All right, Scotty, let them come on over here. All right? Yeah. Can you feel that, Barb? Can you feel that? Daddy, let me have it from here a minute. The stolen car is a brand new top of the range Mustang. A lot of times now we take the roof off the cars, and the reason that being is it's better for stabilizing the patient. All right. It just opens up the whole general area of the vehicle. If they're pinned up under the dash, 
yeah, it's one less thing you have to work around. You, you remove that and you, you're wide open to, to go ahead. If they're conscious, my relationship with the patient is we try to calm them down first off, let them know that we're there to help them and we're going to take care of them. A lot of times they're scared to death, of course, because they don't know what's happening. All they know is they're pinned in this vehicle and all they hear are all these people screaming and yelling, and which makes it worse on them. Can you hear me? We're going to turn you a little to take you out. You just let us do all the work, OK? You just relax. And... Can you move your feet and all? All right, listen, something's coming up under your butt. There we go. Pick it, pick it up a little, guys. OK, now look, I'm going to turn you, OK? Just let us handle it. All right, let's go. I just try to reassure the patient, tell them we're doing everything possible to, to get them out, that it's just going to take some time, but it's got to be done. And, and you'd be surprised that the conscious people work right along with you. Billy, put your legs down for me. You know, when you're a little kid and you see firemen and and how exciting the job is. Every kid, when you're younger, wants to be a fireman. Well, I kind of never grew out of it. Something I've always wanted to do, and uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Across town in the Wild West, Baltimore's busiest fire station is back in business. 13, sick on the street. Being a firefighter in Baltimore City doesn't mean that the only thing we do is fight fires. 50% of our calls are what we term a medic assist. If the medic has a, an extended ETA of five minutes or more, generally they will send out an engine company to get on the scene stabilize the situation, provide first aid as best we can with the materials we have until the arrival of the medic unit. Medic 4 is one of the busier units in the city. A normal day shift is 10 hours, but we do get held over. Sometimes we get caught on the street because we're so busy that we never get back to, to quarters. We will leave early in the morning to go out on the street and take a call and never see the, the station until it's time to get off. There are a lot of times when we get calls out on the street, we can look at the piece of paper and we tell you who we're going out for and why before we even